Hello, hello. Hi, guys. How are you doing? It is LaQueen. Happy Tuesday, July the 14th. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I've got a lot of things to go ahead and take care of. I was able to go ahead and um, read up the literature. I've got some things to take care of today. So bear with me. Bear with me, God. Who else here? Um, again, thank you so much. Very happy to be here in um, Boston. Nothing's changed to the same same game on the streets, but um, I am trying to make progress with the little bit of time I have left. So um, it is mid July. It's almost August. I've got some goals to make. I got some goals to take care of. Some things to handle as well. Mm. My office is a mess, as you can see right now, but I'm trying to get it under control. Really under control, really under control. Really under control. So bear with me, guys, bear with me. Bear with me. And uh, the Queen, Her Royal Majesty, Her, Her Royal Majesty, Queen Elizabeth, did give a live uh, Twitter feed today, so I just want to say hello and happy blessings to the world, English world family, the London world family, as well as to all the um, the uh, royal families around the world who are making changes in government and transitions towards a new society. So I just want to give a shout out to Her Royal Majesty Queen Elizabeth II of the United Kingdom, as well as to her family and everything that they're going through. Um, again, I just want to give a quick feedback to what I was talking about earlier today about the National Mothers March and I was I was able to see them do their live feed on um, ABC News today. So I thought that was really, really cool for um, the mothers of the Black Lives Matter movement to actually talk to ABC News, one of the great um, anchors. Um, I think it's Al, Al's wife, talk about how the Black Lives Matter movement has impacted them. So I just want to go ahead and give a shout out to ABC, thank the news crew at ABC News in New York, as well as to the mothers of the Black Lives Crew, the Black Lives Matter movement. So um, this one makes it here. There has to be a lot of things going on, and so I really do want to be involved in it. I've got pretty much, I've got my little tablet here. i got two tablets. i got my book, my board right here. Pretty much, I need to go to, and so pretty much Queen Elizabeth is just giving a shout out to all her military service people who have committed themselves to servicing the, um, to servicing the United Kingdom, and it's great to actually be involved and be a part of that, be connected with her and her family, so um, I really am not that much connected with my family, I really don't know that much about the Canard Battle family, but um, wherever they are, whoever's involved in the Battle Canard family within government, I in general, just basic city relations, international government relations. I just want to give a shout out to the Battle Canard family, the Battle Canard clan of uh, United States, especially in North Carolina. There's a whole bunch of battles in North Carolina, as well as in East and West Texas, um, Chicago, New York. There's a whole bunch of battles in New York, white and black, as well as all over the United States and abroad. So I'm still doing my research, trying to connect with them. And I have connected with some of them on LinkedIn and Facebook as well. So pretty much I'm going to do a little bit of feedback about the, the National Mothers Mothers March on yesterday, Sunday in Minneapolis, Minnesota. It was a great, great time to connect with these women, these mothers. Very emotional, very spiritual and emotional time for them to be, be together, to unify at the same time, though, they're experiencing a lot of pain, a lot of emotion, a lot of stress, depression, fear, a lot of media scrutiny, and a lack of privacy. They really, all these mothers have a lack of privacy, a big, big, huge, huge privacy issue, especially since your son and daughter's death has been recorded on national television. And your, you and your family are not exposed not only to your, your local community, but to your mayors, your city, your governments, congressmen, all that stuff, as well as to the whole global, global media sensation that when everything goes viral, it go it, it all of it automatically all of, overnight, 
your life could either change from a positive view or it could change into the negative. So usually if something goes viral, your life can go up or it can go down. So pretty much these mothers have been put under a whole bunch of stress, a whole, whole entire, 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 pretty much lots and lots of stress. Stress, stress, stress every single day. So I just want to make sure, can you guys hear me? Okay. okay. I just want to make sure that these mothers are getting the services that they need as well as connecting with them on a better, a, a better feast. So I will be in Minneapolis. Um, not, this is probably going to be, what well, is the mid, middle of July, maybe late July or early August just to go back to Minneapolis, St. Paul, there's, there's been marches going on for the past 45 days since the George Floyd murder. So I'll be going and checking with them as well as to some of the medical uh, medical co-ops that are there. So I just want to give a shout out. Thank you to, uh, to Medical Co-op 312 as well as to Medical Co-op North Star as well as to the independent medics that were there who provided services for over the 2,000 women and families that were there at the National Mothers March on Sunday in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So thank you to all those co-ops as well as to Mass Mass Action of Mass Action of Boston, of Mass, Mass Action of Boston, as well as to all the um, organizations that were a part received services. So I didn't get as much money as a lot of other people did. I I I didn't really get. I got like maybe forty bucks in donations because I did not have assistance. I didn't have, I didn't bring any personal assistance with me. And also at the same time though, I lacked a lot of help that could have got me through. So pretty much during the, there was the, the march by itself. And then there was the, the retreat, the mother's retreat. And I was the only medical staff there in the site, the medical retreat servicing the mothers. They had volunteers there, but they did not have any kind of mental health counselors, therapists to provide emotional and kind of mental health support to these women, especially when you're going through grief, when your child has been murdered and when it has been expo exposed on national television, these women need emotional support as well as mental health services. Not just mental health services, but they need grieving services. And so pretty much I was able to go out to the women, provide some kind of emotional support, a hug, talk to them. I was able to, to counsel. I was actually able to counsel two or three women, let them know, do not be alone. It's going to be okay. You have to work through this because it doesn't happen overnight. I was able to provide some kind of, you know, immediate counseling service to these women. But beyond that, especially when you have a women's retreat for grieving mothers, you need therapists there. You need licensed medical, medical, licensed medical therapists, licensed medical physicians there. And obviously that wasn't the case. They did the, they were a little bit less staffed on that. They had, um, the workshop teachers there were, were very well educated, but at the same time though, um, I really wanted to be more a part of that. So, um, I do really, I am looking for a, a, another personal assistant. Um, I'm very low income right now. Someone who can hopefully volunteer for me and also just provide some kind of feedback. Give me give me some kind of feedback because you know, I get ready, I get I promote all these events, I promote and the, and the promotion goes toward the organizers rather than towards all my hard work that I put into it. So, I'm I'm happy to be involved in the event, I'm happy to work with the organizers, but at the same time, the organizers need medical services just as much as they, as they need the event. You can't have one without the other. You can't have a 5,000 people person event from people marching two miles one one mile you can't have five thousand people marching one mile from one part of the city to a downtown capital without there being any kind of medical services any kind of first aid city local city government local city ems local even even police you still need police even state police there has to be some some kind of medical services set up okay set up for these events and people they're very very imposing we don't want police we don't want we don't want the fire department there we don't want medical services there well you need them anyway and so when the medical when the medical cops come there they are usually well staffed well funded okay 
there was one medical club that was there that had 10 people in it. There was another medical club that, that had about six people in it. But I was by, my, by myself. So at the same time, though, even though they're volunteering, they're still getting reimbursed for some of their services. So I do need an assistant, preferably someone who has been well-versed in rather than a street medic. I need somebody who is great with organizing, who can help me facilitate what I'm going through because I have a whole bunch of... I have a plate load of things that I got to take care of, okay? I've got to do this. I'm doing this um, first aid um, public event, organized event services on the side. I'm also getting ready for graduate school. I've just had three of my friends from, three of my friends graduate from graduate schools with their masters, okay? As well as my little sister, La Princess. She just graduated from um, UC Dominguez, UC California, with her master's degree in social work. So I'm congratulations, La Princess. But at the same time, I'm getting ready to get my graduate degree in nursing. I'm getting ready to prepare myself for medical school. I'm getting ready to prepare myself for medical school, for nursing school. So all of this, everything that I'm doing is not just for one reason at all. Of course, you know, it's normal to be harassed in the street. Today, I got harassed in the street. Someone said, oh, Oh, her da 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 da. It's tight. I know. I know myself because I did her myself. You know, here in Boston, about twenty minutes ago, about five o'clock, when I was walking down Washington Street, crazy. It's just when people see a single black female on the street, they automatically assume, okay, she's available. She's fresh meat, but it's not necessarily happy to be. Okay, so I've been through a whole bunch of personal life issues with relationships with people, as well as progressing towards my future career and towards my future exports, okay? So even though I'm doing this on the side, you know, I'm still homeless, I'm still on social security, I'm still getting social services, food stamps, social security, everything like that. I am still building a business for myself. I'm still building a career, a future for myself so that I can slowly and gradually get up out of that circle out of that special needs, out of that cycle, that constant cycle that the government or that people try to impose on somebody that is low income and especially is colored people. They try to impose a system on you where even if you are married as a black folk or as a colored folk still in 2020 millennial era, okay, you are still getting imposed on with you. You need food stamps. You need to go to social services. You need to sign up for welfare, okay? You need to get on Section 8, you know, as, as if Black people are not able to afford the normal, normal rent in a normal society, okay? Section 8 is not everything that's cracked up to be. Yes, it is low income. Yes, it's 30% of your rent. That's great. Hey, but at the same time, though, understand the Section 8 helps with the with subsidize your rent, but you still need to be able to afford the regular cost of living in any city that you live in. So you can't be on Section 8 in New York City and expect to have a, a glamorous life in New York City when you're on Section 8. That is not going to happen. If you're in Section 8 in Boston, Massachusetts, you cannot expect to have a glamorous life in Boston, Massachusetts just because you got Section 8. Oh, no, 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 that's not going to happen. If you're in Chicago, Illinois, Dallas, Texas, or even if you're on Section 8 in San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, the Bay Area, you cannot expect to have a glamorous life on Section 8, living in glamorous cities. It's not going to work that way because you, your rent is just 30% of your income, but the rest of the 60% six, of your income, you have to be able to afford the cost of living in that Highly expensive city. Highly expensive. Seattle, Washington. Thank you, Dwayne. Seattle, Washington, San Francisco, California, New York City, even Chicago, Illinois, even on the north side of Chicago, Illinois. Okay. Near the near Wrigley Field. You cannot expect to be on Section 8 living in Wrigley Field. Okay. You cannot expect to be on Section 8 living in the Bay Area. You cannot expect to be in Section 8 living in San Diego, California. It's not going to work out that way. And what a lot of people do, especially Mexican and African immigrants do, they come together as a family. Every single body in that household works as a family. If they're doing uh, gig jobs, they're cleaning, they're um, 
they're braiding hair, they're going to school, they're working two jobs, they got a business on the side, and they got another job on the side. Everybody in that household is working or going to school, especially immigrants, especially Mexican and African and Arabic immigrants. Everybody in the household is working, even abuela. Are they taking care of abuela or abuelo? That's how it works. And usually a household of immigrants has no more or less than eight people in it. Everybody is living under that household. That's how it works, okay? So you cannot expect to be a single person with three kids living on Section 8 in a very highly expensive city like Boston, Massachusetts. When you walk down the, the city streets and the Boston Housing Authority is boarded up, but it has the door open available, like, please come in. Well, the windows are boarded up. How do you expect people to know that it's open? But there's no open sign, but you got the windows boarded up. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. So I have to go to another housing office. Okay. So there's a lot of issues I got to work on as well as, you know, I'm doing some more of my genealogy. Um, I'm working on um, expanding, expanding my business. So getting set up, getting an office set up in New York, a clinic, okay, a small office clinic, a small, even if it's a community clinic, even if it's a free clinic, I am trying to get something set up like that in New York, okay? Either in the boroughs, in Brooklyn, in Queens, in the Bronx, Harlem, something like that, get that set up in New York by September. <laughs> Crazy, right? Crazy logo. So I already talked to Ben, my agent, about it. Um, but again, again, people have expectations. They put expectations on you. Okay, like these are my expectations for a single black female. These are my goals for a single black, black female. Okay, you know, especially a single black female with special needs. No, you have your own expectations for me and I have my own expectations for myself. I don't need you to impose any kind of um, goals or any kind of um, um, heights on me or limitations on me. The only person who could put limitations on you is yourself. Okay, even people with special needs, okay, are getting married. People with special needs, especially disabled people, they're working full-time jobs, they're publishing books, they're traveling, they're, they're preaching, they have, they're on TED Talks, <laughs> you know, they're doing TED Talks, they have their own businesses, they're married with kids. I saw, I saw another disabled mother at the march, she had three kids, a single disabled woman three kids in her, in her wheelchair, you know, and it didn't face her at all being in a wheelchair and having three beautiful young girls, but she's able to function on her life, but I'm not able to function on with my life as a single black female. It doesn't work like that way. You can't, sometimes you really have to just be like, I'm fed up with, I'm fed up. I, you can't deal with people's attitudes. You get into your space, you get into your house, you get into your locale, wherever you're going to. And you pretty much just have to say, thank you God for another day. I'm here in my space. I'm alone in my space and I have peace. That's pretty much how it is sometimes. Okay. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts so much. But at the same time though, you can only put limitations on yourself. Okay. So especially dealing with these women and these mothers that have been through so much emotional trauma, Ahmaud Arbery's mother, Joy, George Floyd's mother, Breonna Taylor's mother, all these mothers that came together and had the ABC News talk today, discussion with Robin Roberts, not Robin Roberts, the other lady, um, Al's wife, they came together and they talked about, we still have a lot to work on as a community. All these mothers of the Black Lives Matter movement. We're not even done. We haven't even started doing what we need to do during this movement. And so it's great. It is wonderful to have these mothers come together and for these women to help reorganize the movement because right now, all these protesting, people on the streets, these white kids, these black kids, these Latino kids, these native kids, everybody is just has so much energy. So, so much energy, but the energy is going nowhere. Okay. This energy is going nowhere. Okay. Let's protest. Let's go from one side of the city to city to Capitol Hill. 
and let's protest. Let's protest. Let's preach and scream and yell to our mayors and to our local government people that we want to change, that we want to defund the police, that we want to stop police brutality, that we want to take away the entire budget of the police department. Well, you know what, honey? That's not going to happen. You have to think realistically. Like, realistically, when a, a single black female walks down the street, she's going to be harassed wherever she goes. Realistically, that's the truth. Realistically. In today's modern 2020 Trump administration, you really just have to get over yourself real quick. But in reality, though, it doesn't have to be that way. But you still have to get used to it. Realistically, though, these mothers, their children are dead. George Floyd is dead. Breonna Taylor is dead. Ahmaud Arbery is dead. Realistically. But in reality, they don't have the families do not have to be by themselves. They don't have to be alone, suffering in their pain alone. You do not have to be alone to be constantly harassed by people. Yes, Laqueen, I, Laqueen Battle have been raped. Yes, I, Laqueen Battle have been abused by men and women. Yes, I, Laqueen Battle have had my hair cut. I've been molested. I've been abused. I've been exposed to a lot, a lot of trauma as a young child and even as a young woman. I'm still being constantly assaulted and abused every single day. But who, who am I going to give the power to? Am I going to give my power away to the to the, to the person who took away my power? Or am I going to claim my power back for myself and get in a better place? In a better place and a better frame of mind? Am I going to give my money and my power away for, to, to some doctor who I'm going to see for, the, for 30 minutes for the next 10 years of my life? And then walk out of that room the same way that I came back in? Or am I going to turn my life, my story my history into power and use it to help other people or connect with somebody else that has been through exactly what I have been through. That have been through the breast cancer scare at 30 years old. That have been molested as a young child. That have been date raped. That have been abused by the church system. Abused by ministers who who call themselves ministers of God but leave you straight out in the in the on the cold street alone. Who call themselves ministers and pastors and, and worship ministers and singers and evangelists and tele, televangelists. But when they turn their back, they want you to serve them. On your hands and feet, they want you to serve them. Wherever you go in the world, they still want you to serve them. Whether you like it or not. Whether you get paid for it or not. They still want you to service them. These men of God. Men and women of God. And the wives sit back there and laugh. Like, you don't know what your job is? These families, women, single women, black women, as well as everybody else in the current current global economy has a lot to go through. There's a lot of abuse being a single person as well as being a mother of a child that has been just murdered. Okay? There is a lot of pain to connect with that. I can connect with my personal, my personal story, losing my son, have an abortion, have been, been sexually abused, and then I can connect with other women and other families that have been through losing their child. That have been through a divorce. That have been through problems with the police and government and military system. And sometimes the police, especially the military, can be worse off than, the, than your local police. If you have problems with the military, that can scar you for life worse than your local police force can. And nowadays, especially with, with groups like the KKK and all these white nationalists, white supremacy groups, and even Black Panther, they don't give a damn if people have been in the military or not. Hey, you service our country? Thank you, but we still don't give a damn. You served our country? That's great. But we still want you to service us. And we don't give a damn about your military history or not. You're still a Negro. You were born a Negro and you will die a Negro. And we don't give a damn about your military history or not. That's your job. Your job is to be a Negro from the day you, bo you are born to the day you die. That's your job. Especially in the military, it's worse. Because in the military, it's put under the rug. People don't talk about it.
And if you have a problem with the military, wherever you go in the world, that military, that military history will haunt you for life. Rather than if you just had a police problem, you could just go to another city or move or go go stay with some, some cousins or whatever. But if you have an issue with the military, that will haunt you for life. People don't, they don't understand that. But you still have to connect with some people on a different level. Okay. There's still a lot of healing to do. Healing for myself and healing for the black community. Healing for the colorful community. community. There is still a lot to do. A lot to do. And I've had a lot of I've had a lot of exes that have been in the military. I've had exes that have been um in government, you know, that work in government, politics, that own businesses that are cops. So yeah, I have exes that are like that, great. But at the same time, they could put on a different suit any time of the day and get away with it. They could just change their shirt and you'd be surprised who they were. Oh, all I did was just change my shirt and look who I am now. I changed my shirt and get into a vehicle and look who I am now. I changed my shirt and walked down the street and look who I am now. I changed my shirt and put on a hat and and get, get into another vehicle and look who I am now. You'd be surprised how people who, who who people are nowadays and what they can get away with. And you see that same face all the time. But a different shirt and a different hat? No. So these families, as well as to the Black Lives Movement, as well as to all families dealing with police brutality, prejudice hate groups, white nationalist groups, black nationalist groups, a lot of these families that are going through violence have issues to deal with. It's going to take some time for these families to heal. It's not going to happen overnight. And the expectations that these families have have for themselves is different from the expectations that the media has on them, as well as the, the expectations that I have for myself as a single black person female young woman is different for the limitations that society tries to put on me. It's not, it can't, it can't be one of the same. The family that just died, had their son that was just murdered, can't have the same mentality as the national, the, the nationwide media. Okay. The family that their son or daughter just died under police brutality, that their, that their sons and daughters death was recorded on national television, they cannot have that same frame of mind as the organizers that are trying to help them out as the lawyers, okay? Because if you try to have the same frame of mind as a lawyer or as an organization that is pretty much trying to get money around your pain, then it makes you gullible to other people's, to people who are attracted to your pain. And a lot of families are, right now, they're weak, they're gullible, they don't know what to do. They're hurting and they're very easily manipulated. Because people are making money off of their notoriety, their celebrity, the celebrity of their son's death. And yes, somebody, uh, yes, if your family member has died, that family member that is still living can become a celebrity overnight just off the death of their family member. Did I say that right? Yeah, I said it right. I said, you can make a celebrity out of somebody's death. Yeah, my brother was just murdered. Okay, your brother was just murdered. But that does not make you a a nationwide celebrity. Oh, yeah, I'm a celebrity now. Yeah, you're a celebrity, but where have you been before? Have you been fighting for the movement before your brother was murdered? 
and all of a sudden overnight now you're a celebrity? No, it doesn't work like that. You can't have the same frame of mind. You ha- the, Usually the families, they have to have either somebody within the family or somebody in the community to work for them to have that frame of mind that the family needs to go. So the family, the family has to have a higher frame of mind than the lawyers or the community activists or whoever's trying to help support them. Because if the family does not have that higher frame of mind than what it is a lawyer can come in, or any kind of community activism group could come in, take all that fame away from that family and use it for their own good and make millions and millions of dollars off of the fame of that family's death. And at the end of the day, that family won't get a cent. That family won't get a dime. Yeah, but didn't they just have a, a nationwide walk? Hasn't the hasn't the whole whole community, black community, millions of people been protesting and marching for hours and hours and miles and miles just over one black man's death? Yeah, the whole entire America, United States, has been marching for miles and miles and days and days. But what what about the family? Does the family have any money or is it getting anything out of this? Is the family still living in that same community? Has the has the man or daughter been buried? Had a proper funeral and a proper burial. Has the family housing expenses been taken care of? Has the family's mortgage been paid off? Has the family's car bills been paid? Has the family's utilities bills been paid? Has the family lawyer's bills been paid? But somebody in the, in the family is a celebrity now. They're getting paid. But what about the mother? Is she getting paid? The mother still has bills. Yeah. The mother, the mothers still have bills. They still got to take care of their bills. They still got to pay their rent, pay their mortgages. And a lot of those families are living in the same house, in the same city, in the same low-income apartment, as nothing has changed since their child has been murdered. It is a shame. It is a shame. It is a shame. It's a shame that people got to yell out your life story on the street and you can't even use that to, to, to claim for yourself. I can't claim my, my identity for myself, but somebody got to yell it on the streets for me to publicize, publicize my, 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 my life on the streets. But I can't, I can't, I can't use it for myself. People gotta use my use my life and tell my business on the streets, but I can't even talk about it for myself. My son has just been murdered and I can't do anything about it. But hear people talk about it, but I can't I can't use that pain for myself. I gotta bear people talking over me instead of using that for myself. I can't talk for my I can't speak for myself. As a mother whose son has been shot, I can't speak for myself. But I have to have somebody else speak for me. And most of the time, that person that's speaking for me does not have any of my interests in mind at heart. It's real, It's sad. It's sad. It's sad. It's sad. It's very sad. It's re- it's really sad. It's very sad. It is very very sad.
It's not even about somebody has stolen your identity. It's just that you can't claim your life for yourself. Sometimes it doesn't even have to be that somebody stole your identity. It's just that people are using your business for the, for their livelihood. People are making money off of your business. And it, they don't even have to steal your identity or whatever. They don't even have to use a credit card in, in your name. All they have to do is know something about your life, your life story and they can make money off of that. They can make a business off of that. They can make millions of dollars off of just one part of your life and walk away from your life, talk to you for five minutes, and then five minutes later, they're millionaires. They're senators, they're congresspeople. And all they did was just talk to you for five minutes. I thought, we just had a brief five-minute conversation. How are you now on TV? How are, how are you now reporting about my business on national TV? We only talked, I only saw you last week at the laundry mat. I only saw you last week at CBS and now you're on nationwide TV talking about what we talked about, our private conversation. Mm-hmm. We just had a private conversation at CBS Walgreens and now all of a sudden you're on nationwide national TV. Yeah. So what are you going to do about it? Are you going to sue me? Yeah, they could sue you. You could sue them. But it's a, it's, a, it's a waste of time. And that's what a lot of these families are going are going through. Even their family members are selling out to the family. It is a shame. It is a shame. But there's a lot to go through. I have a lot to process. And again, you know, I'm trying to bring my best. to keep it together. Yeah, there are problems in the black community with autism. There's a lot of issues in the black community with autism, with people with special needs. Completely agree with that. That have behavior disorder problems. Problems with the police. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that exists in the black community, especially in the black community. But you know what? We have to work together instead of against each other. So again, there's a lot I have to go through. But anyway, this is Queen Battle, live from Boston, Massachusetts. Please continue to keep me in your thoughts and prayers. I have to be careful when I walk down the street. Oh my God. Crazy. She's trying to enjoy uh, being in the public. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I've got so many books to read. I'm going to read this one. Oh, Apothecary. 
how medicines were set up in the old 1900s. Old apothecary, how they had old medicine set up, as well as this one. I got from Bartles, Bartles Bookshop. It's called the People's Medical Medical Advisor. If you can see it, guys. And this one has great information in it. Great, great, great information on, on medicine. I have to read that. I have so many books. I got, I got a mountain full of books. I've got to do some webinars this week. I've got to get ready and do some Zoom webinars this week. And I'm already behind as well as apply to graduate school, even to Oxford, even to Paris, even to France, even to Canada, and talk with some people and talk about what is going on with COVID and why has the United States still not reopened. And it is already August 2020. It's time for school, the school fall semester to start. And the government is still not ready to, to recover from this infectious disease, okay? From New York to Chicago to LA and even Dallas to Florida, the government, the, the American government is still not ready to recover from COVID-19 coronavirus. And what happens in the United States goes to London and Paris and Germany. And other countries like the islands, like Asia and Thailand and Vietnam. And what I've read about Vietnam today is that the, that the country of Vietnam does not have one single positive coronavirus case. The country of Vietnam. So if Asia is able to recover from the COVID virus, and Asia has 2.5 billion people and India has 1 billion people. Okay, why is what is lagging behind with the United States and Western, Western uh, England and Western Europe? So there's still a lot of issues I have to address with what's going on, especially with the National Walk on Washington and the Democratic Convention, which is next month. <laughs> The Republican convention was this month in Tulsa, Oklahoma, but the Democratic convention is going to be next month. I don't know what city that Joe Biden and his VP is going to have it in, but as soon as I hear information about the Democratic convention, I will be posed to be there, <laughs> as well as participate and be involved in the National March of Washington again and be involved in the Democratic National Convention, which is less than six weeks away. So I will try to talk to the organizers of the Democratic National Convention, make sure that they have not just hand sanitizing services, it's great to have the whole crowd hand sanitized, but you just pretty much need common sense, okay? You need um, people to come in there, check if anybody's coughing, and anybody has guns, weapons, you know what I mean, just general common sense, as well as check on the health care and well-being of elderly adults and young children. That is primary over anything having to do with hand sanitizing and anything having to do with the infection control. If you do not check care on the well-being of older adults over 65, as well as young children under five, three to five years old, all that hand sanitizing, all that infection control will not will not mean a dime. You have to take care on the well-being and needs of the weakest population first, especially in airports, okay? <laughs> Where the virus is transmitted the fastest and the worst, okay? So that's another issue that I talked about today, that the airports do not have any kind of medical services. So check on the well-being of the elderly population, geriatric population, the baby boomers, as well as what's going on with the younger children, three to five years old and under, especially with infants. Okay, they have that, they get they get that that COVID-19 on their hands and their feet. And it, it may look like chicken pox, but it's not chicken pox. So that is another issue. Okay. So really working in a convention, any kind of march, 10,000 people march, convention, whatever it is. You still have to check on the well-being of those that are weakest, which is pretty much, like I said before, the older baby boomer population and the younger kids, as well as the disabled and special needs population. And most of the time, most of the time, if they are disabled and special needs, they will always, always, always 
have a companion, a family member, or somebody beside them every single where they go. Okay, if they are special needs and if they are disabled in a wheelchair, they will have a companion with them. It's either a family member, relative companion, or a somebody that has been hired specifically to deal with that person, or they may have a service animal, but they usually always have somebody, a companion with them, an animal companion or a family or a worker companion with them, especially if their special needs is disabled and especially if they are in a large crowd event, okay? A large crowd event, okay? A, any kind of large event over, even if the event is over 100 people, 1,000 people, that's disabled special needs person, okay? Has have some kind of companion beside them to make sure they know what they're doing, okay? Now, the queen bottle, <laughs> I'm always by myself. So what does that mean for me? Hmm? <laughs> I've hired three workers and they all quit. So what does that mean? <laughs> I need a dog. <laughs> so it's just stuff like that, okay? So dealing with the Democratic Convention, COVID-19 should not be an issue, okay? Because pretty much right now with Dr. Fossey and the uh, the COVID, um, whatever vice president, President Pinch and his staff is working on the COVID task force. They pretty sure much have it under control because a, a vaccine is great. Yeah, we got a vaccine, but at the same time, we need to deal with the current present population right now. The current pres present population is still not have recovered from this COVID coronavirus. The present population, the present present population, still has not recovered from this coronavirus. Okay, the present. American population in the North, East, West, and South, especially in Miami and Texas, have still not recovered from this coronavirus. The rates are not going down, they're going up. So that is another issue, okay? Great to hand sanitize a crowd, great to provide infection control services, great to have uh, 100 medics on staff for a, a 10,000 people event, but if you do not take care of the special needs population, especially pregnant women, okay, pregnant women who are by themselves do not have a garter belt. They don't have a garter belt and they're marching for a mile, two miles. They don't have a family member beside them and they don't have their kids around them. That is also another issue. If you have a pregnant woman, she's by herself and she's at a large event. That right there is another issue that I've got to talk about how they treat, how they are, how they are treating pregnant women. Okay. So if you have a special needs population, older adults over 65, young children under five years old, even if the kids are by themselves, they're young kids, they're under 12 years old, okay? They still need to have a companion by them and you still need to check on their physical, you need to do a quick wellness check. Is the child, is the adult coughing? Are they having any nasal drainage, okay? Do they have any nasal drainage? Are they yeah, nasal drainage? Are they coughing? Does it look like their face is flush? Is their hair bell? Are they? Did they have a, a a forward back glance? Do they look like they're staring into outer space? Go check on that baby. Go check on that child. Go check on that adult, and just just ask them, "Are you okay?" Can I get a yes or a no? And the older adult will be like, "Yeah, I'm okay." And if it's a baby, you still have to ask them, "Are you okay?" Yes or no? And that child will just say yes, or they'll give you, "Can I get a thumbs up, baby?" And the baby will, even like a six month old child, they can still give you a thumbs thumbs up. A six month old child can still give you a thumbs up or a thumbs down. A six month old baby can still give you, as a medical provider, a thumbs up. Okay, baby, are you okay? Can I get a thumbs up? And baby will respond back, thumbs up. So it's just a quick, 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 quick wellness check. And also, if they're disabled and they're pregnant, pregnant women, yes, pregnant women are disabled. Okay. Being pregnant is not a physical disability, but you are disabled. You have somebody in your womb. You are not able to function fully at your full capacity. So pregnant women are disabled. They are in the disabled population. They need to be treated as such. Okay. So pregnant woman, go to pregnant woman, make it sure, check her, her, um, her wrist and check her ankles. Make it sure that her wrist and her ankles are not swollen making sure that her face is not flush and making sure that she's sitting in an upright position. If that pregnant woman is bowed over and her face is red, is purple, get help. 
If she's breathing heavily, get help. It's common sense. <laughs> if the pregnant woman, if her knees are swollen, if her ankles and her wrists, her ankles and her wrists are swollen, get a chair for the pregnant woman to sit down, have her do some deep breathing exercises, and get her a glass of water. Ask her if she on any kind of medication, and just get a nice cold ice pack to make sure that she's good so that the swelling can go down. And you can carry on with the rest of the of the journey. Okay, so there's a lot of things I got to talk about. I'm also doing a webinar. I've got like two webinars to do today. But thank you guys for hanging. It was about 15 minutes, 55 minutes into my live. We still got a lot to do. We still got a lot to do work on the community, especially with helping families and mothers grieve from this movement, as well as making sure that we pay attention to the special populations that are needed to help the United States recover from this coronavirus. There's so many issues going on right now that all these governors, all these senators, all these leadership need to focus on. But the main, main issues right now that all the mayors, all the governors, Governor Cuomo, Governor Prisker, Governor Abbott in Texas, Governor Newsom in California, all these governors need to focus on is number one, Black Lives Matter, police number one, the graffiti, the load, the loitering in the streets, okay? Okay, as well as which is which is affecting their economy, their 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 economy in every city. And the, the the second thing is coronavirus, COVID-19. You can't have one without the other. So it's either COVID-19 has main priority or the Black Lives Matter movement has second priority. You can't have one without the other. And every single large major city in the United States right now, especially in London and Paris and Germany, are dealing with the same issue, especially in London and especially in Germany. They're dealing with the same issue. Do we focus on the Black Lives Matter protests or do we focus on COVID-19? What is the main priorities right now? Because the economy is 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 lo worse anyway than it has ever been. But we still need to focus on those main issues. COVID-19 and police brutality and violence on the streets. Okay, and prejudice, a lot of issues. So I'm going to go ahead and get ready for my webinars. I've got to be applying. I've got to look for, I need a personal assistant. The name of all. <laughs> I need another personal assistant, somebody to help me make money. <laughs> Thank you, Dwayne. Thank you. I love you. Coming live from Boston, Massachusetts, I still got a lot of issues to work on. Shout out to Mayor Marty Wash here in Boston. Shout out to Mayor Bill Bellazio in New York City. Shout out to Mayor um, Lloyd Lightfoot in Chicago, as well as a whole bunch of local city mayors that I don't know about, as well as to the governor, Governor Jamie Prisco of Illinois, Governor um, Andrew Cuomo of New York, Governor Greg Abbott of Texas, Governor Newsom of California, which I have families living in all these cities and states. That's why I'm giving recognition to these governors. <laughs> I have family members immediate family members living in these states. So I have to give recognition to them. And especially to, I don't know if Jeb Bush is still governor of Florida, but a lot, a lot, a lot of recognition goes to these governors for trying to implement security measures, local government security measures dealing with the Black Lives Matter protests and COVID-19. And they both hit the United States at one time and completely destroyed the economy. So every single where you go in the United States, you're going to see boarded up buildings, okay? But in Chicago, it was different, okay? But we still got a lot to work on as a community. So this is Queen Battle live from Boston, Massachusetts, downtown, here in my office, um, getting ready to work on building a clinic, applying to nursing medical school, <laughs> applying for my community health license doing three webinars in two weeks and looking for a personal assistant and housing and a job at the same time. <laughs> All right, so I got a lot to do. I'm a hot mess and constantly getting harassed on the street being a single black female. So bear with me, guys. I got a, I got a lot to do. I got a lot to deal with any emotions as well, but I still need your help like you need mine. I love you guys. Here's Queen Battle of Battle First Aid Responder Services live from downtown Boston, Massachusetts. I love you guys. Please continue to keep me in your thoughts and prayers.
Salome. Thank you so much, guys. Love, peace, peace and blessings to you all. Bye.